Um, just to let you know that I'm a fan of the Alumni Association. I'm going to step out here and let you see that I've got a Secret Service pin on here. And on this side, West Virginia University alumni. So I have to tell you that when Kim asked me if I would do this tonight, it took about 20 seconds for me to say, yeah, I'd be very happy to do it. Not, not because I'm a member of a uh, Toastmasters club and I have to get in my hours of speaking, but because West Virginia has always been very special to me. I wish I could remember how many times I've said to other groups when I'm speaking at a group that uh, West Virginia is very special because whatever I've achieved in, in my life and whatever accomplishments I've made came out of West Virginia and the people who gave me the, re the direction in West Virginia. So I will be eternally grateful for that. And uh, anytime they ask me if I'll do something for West Virginia, I, as long as I can afford it, as long as I can, am capable of doing it, I usually do it. Now, the, the information that I'm gonna give you tonight uh, is a little bit different than most of the speeches that I've made in the past. I have uh, talked uh, to many, many groups during the time that I was in the Secret Service. And it was uh, civic groups and uh, military groups. And, and it was sort of a generic speech. So I did it so much that it really didn't take me a lot of preparation to do. And, and uh, it was generic in the sense that this is the Secret Service, this is what the Secret Service does. And uh, if you're interested in a career, this is the way you go about uh, getting into the Secret Service. Incidentally, sir, thank you for your thank contributions. You, I have two other members of the service here with me. Congratulations. Anyway, today's speech uh, or remarks are completely different than that. Because well, I have five objectives. Uh, I'd like to give you three of those objectives and, and describe them, and then come back and describe the last two at the end of our presentation. But um, the first two are nothing more than remarks, nothing more than a statement. And I would like you to listen carefully when I say what I have to say. So I think I can accomplish those first two uh, statements. And I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have stayed up with the Secret Service and you know what has transpired in recent months and recent years. But I want to say this, and, and I, I will establish my first goal. And that is to say that I humbly I'm going to repeat that. I humbly admit that in, even in view of some of the transgressions that have occurred in the Secret Service in recent months and recent years, the Secret Service still has the reputation for being the elite of the elite law enforcement. And, and that's not my opinion. Uh, that's the opinion of all other law enforcement agencies, whether they be federal or local. So that, that's a statement that I mean sincerely, and I'm happy to say it. The second statement uh, is also something that I should be able to accomplish very easily by simply having you believe me, and that is that uh, I humbly uh, regret that the Secret Service has been guilty of some transgressions recently. And again, I don't know how much you all keep up with the Secret Service, but 
We've had some, uh, some situations that were blown out of proportion with the newspaper, but nonetheless they occurred, and I'm not going to offer an explanation for it. The third thing I want to do is to give you uh, an overabundance of information. And the purpose of my doing that is I want you to arrive at a conclusion. I don't want to give you the conclusion. I'd like you to arrive at it. Uh, and I really believe that after you hear it, you will probably uh, agree with what I have to say. So the best place to start uh, in giving you that information is to give you a brief history of the Secret Service. Now, I don't want to give you a history lesson, but as it applies to the Secret Service, it's really uh, important, and there are some, there's some irony involved with it. Most people believe that the Secret Service was initiated for the purpose of protecting the President of the United States. And, and that's not true. In 1860, following the Civil War, about one third of our counterfeit currency of money was uh, counterfeit currency. And so the uh, population was losing all kinds of confidence. So President Tr uh, Lincoln went to our legislation and said, look, this is so serious that if we can't keep our people uh, confident in our currency, we have a chance of going down as a, company, as a country. So they talked about it and decided what to do. And prior to that time, there was no federal agency. Everything was local law enforcement agency. The only agency that covered a large territory of uh, uh, land was probably the Texas Rangers. So they said, okay, which, what can we do? Well, let's, let's make uh, a federal law enforcement agency. And so most people don't realize that either, but the Secret Service was the first federal law enforcement agency established. But here's uh, the beginning of the crux of what I'm gonna say to you throughout this whole lecture. And that is that uh, the Secret Service at that time was given the responsibility and the sole responsibility to suppress counterfeit currency. Nothing else. They said, this is your job, do that. And they gave them uh, probably far fewer agents than they should have had. But they did, in fact, give them a lot of good training. So in a very short period of time, the counterfeit currency was, in fact, uh, put under control, and, uh, and everybody was pleased. The legislators, the president was pleased. I mean, we still had some counterfeit currency, but not as much as it was, because the majority of it before was uh, Confederacy money. So following that situation, uh, they said, now that we've got a federal law enforcement agency, we're going to uh, use them for all federal crimes. So uh, why don't we use them to do things like uh, uh, land fraud, uh, counter espionage, uh, uh, bank fraud. Uh, why don't we use them to assist local law enforcement for bank robberies? And the, so the Secret Service then caught all that all those responsibilities. Uh, and so now I want to start this and show you uh, just to make sure you understand that there's a comparison between all the other federal agencies that started and what their charter was in the very beginning and how it compares to the charter of the Secret Service and the, how the charter of the Secret Service grew and, and I want to say this also up front, 
that any time there is a change in the charter of an agency, there has to be a change in manpower, in training, in budget. And I'm sure some people know about what I'm talking about. <laughs> and many times that did not occur. So the Secret Service was doing all of that. But I want to put up, uh, let's see if I can get this. This is just a perfect example. Uh, the FBI, as you know, most of its responsibilities are to protect against, uh, right here at the bottom, this is right now, is what they're most protecting against, terrorism attacks and cyber-based attacks. But before that, they did all the things here, protecting against espionage, civil rights, and all that business. Guess who was doing it before that time? Secret Service. So as soon as they came into being, that relieved the Secret Service of some of their responsibilities, but not all of them. The next agency is uh, the CIA. Uh, I want to go back to that last slide. If you review that, and say, what has uh, changed in this agency? Since the time they started, what has changed in their charter? And the answer is nothing. If there's anything that happened is these last two have gained a lot of uh, emphasis, but nothing else has changed. CIA, responsibility of CIA is to gather intelligence, feed it to the president, feed it to the National Security Agency, and also practice counter, uh, counter uh, espionage. And if you look at their changes in their uh, charter, nothing has changed, except maybe they've done a little bit more in this area where they engage in counterintelligence and it's been effective. If you go to the next one, okay, the NSA are the cryptologists, these guys that uh, are interested in uh, having a message go from point A to point B without somebody intercepting it in between. Sometimes it's actually still mechanical. Sometimes it's technical. And uh, in addition to that, uh, they also want then, in reverse of that, they want to intercept information that goes from point A to point B. This is the, when George Bush put the Patriot Act, this is what caused all the consternation about the uh, Fourth Amendment because people were saying, this is a violation of my privacy. Fourth Amendment saying that you have the right of the people to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures and unless there is probable cause. Well, I I'm going to give you not just what, what this, how this works, but I'm also going to give you my opinion. I'm sure that uh, if I were to ask all of you in here, do you believe in the Patriot Act? Do you believe it's something that's necessary? And all I can say is from, from my experience and what I really believe is that we don't have the Patriot Act. We have the first losses and big losses against the fight on terrorism. Because the people in NSA are not concerned about infidelity. They're not concerned about marijuana. They're not concerned about uh, any other use of drugs. They're not concerned about immoral behavior. They're concerned about national security. So if by chance 
you happen to have a telephone conversation that were just by chance listened into because in some way it got tangled up with something that looked like it was going to be national security, it would be by accident. And as soon as they found that out, they would discard that. So uh, I'm really curious uh, if you know what the Patriot Act is, and you are a lot of young people in here, I'd like to know how many of you feel that the Patriot Act is against our Constitution. I think that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. Because you can't believe how many people are against it. They say, I don't want anybody listening to my telephone conversation. They just don't understand it. Okay. So, uh, Now, in contrast to all of that, I want to show you the evolution of the mission of the Secret Service. And my purpose in showing you this is whereas all of those other agencies were very, very stable, now the Secret Service is going to be going up and down, adding, subtracting, and, and all the kinds of things that add to a budget, add to manpower, and add to other requirements. Before I start this though, I'm gonna give you a real brief history lesson on our presidents and until such time that we, until such time that we started uh, presidential protection. And there, as I said, there's some irony in that. Uh, when we started to do the counterfeit investigations, we also added other responsibilities in there. And so for a period of time, the Secret Service did nothing but that. And it took 37 years and three assassinations later for the Secret Service to begin to protect the President of the United States. But we all know that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth and his motive was nothing more than the fact that he was uh, against the abolition of slavery. And we also know that uh, he uh, was a, a sympathizer of the Confederacy. And we also know that he was an actor. I don't know that that had anything to do with it. If we go then to uh, 1881, our next president was James Garfield. He was assassinated by a guy named Charles Guiteau. And you should like this motive. Charles Guiteau had written a speech, and the speech that he delivered was profound, had nothing to do with James Garfield, had nothing to do with the election that was in process. But he felt very strongly that what he was saying was the reason why James Garfield was able to defeat his opponent in that election. And so he wanted some compensation for it. He either wanted to be on that uh, cabinet, on the, on the president's cabinet, or he wanted some financial compensation. And when he didn't get it, his solution was to assassinate James Garfield. In uh, 1901, William McKinley was assassinated. And this motive was pure and simple. This man, his name was, uh, uh, it's a strange name, it was uh, uh, Leon Zogaz. And his, his reason for assassinating uh, William McKinley was simply that uh, he thought he was an anarchist. He was an anarchist and he wanted to get away with all government. And he thought William McKinley was the man that was really forcing government. 
So, as I said, 37 years later, and three presidents later, they decided the same legislators, the same people who were, uh, who were interested in uh, protecting presidents and interested in uh, these other investigations and the counterfeit currency, said, you know, we have to do something about this. So the first president was, that was protected by the Secret Service was Teddy Roosevelt right after William McKinley was assassinated. And um, the interesting thing about this is the irony of this is the legislation that was put on President Lincoln's desk uh, the day before he went to Ford Theater and was assassinated was the very legislation that created the agency that would ultimately protect the president of the United States, but he never saw it. Anyway, so that's the brief uh, history of the Secret Service up until this point. And now I, the purpose in showing you this is again, as I said, I want to show you how the Secret Service goes up and down in what their responsibilities are. They gain more, they lose, they gain more, they lose, but in most cases, they're gaining a great more than they're losing. And in many cases, there is no adjustment to their budget nor to their manpower. So here we are, 1865, given the responsibility to suppress counterfeit currency, 1870, gradually picked up all federal crimes. And I, I mentioned those before, <coughs> land fraud, bank fraud, uh, all, all kinds of uh, public corruption, uh, counter espionage, all that. Secret Service had all that. So they picked those up between 1865 and 1870. Uh, and then in 1901, they added the protection. Uh, and they still did all these other investigations. They still continued to do the other you know, investigations. Then with the establishment of the FBI, it gave them a break. FBI took over all those crimes that the Secret Service was doing on behalf of being a federal law enforcement agency. But the Secret Service then also picked up the Bunko schemes, the gold cases, the forgery cases. So in essence, they didn't lose any anything in terms of manpower and requirements and training. The next period of time. Now, you might read this one and say President Warren Harding had uh, established the White House police. Well, what he did was went out and said, we've got all these people in the Metropolitan Police Department. We've got all these people in the National uh, Police Force in the park police. And I've got all these people around me protecting me, but the, the White House is not protected. So he brought in the White House police and said, we're going to call you the White House police. And it may appear as though that should be no consequence to the Secret Service. But it was. It was a consequence because they still had to supervise them. And that took additional manpower. 1930, they were transferred to the Uniform Division. And uh, in 1946, when the CIA came into being, they dropped all those responsibilities that the, uh, that the CIA was doing, uh, which was probably their best uh, relief. 1963, now I can tell you I was personally involved in this one because uh, I was teaching school at that time and I was a uh, biology teacher and I coached football and I coached wrestling. And I was on my way home from wrestling practice. And in those days when you turn the radio on, it took a little bit of time for it to warm up so that it would become audible. But the first thing that I heard was the president is dead. 
And I had uh, two boys on my wrestling team whose daddies were Secret Service agents. And they kept coming to me every once in a while and saying, we'd like to have you be a Secret Service agent. And I kept saying, I don't want to have anything to do with law enforcement. But when this happened, uh, I, I don't know how many of you were around, but I got this uh, really uh, insecure feeling in my gut. And as I got closer to my house, I saw people crying. And it was an unbelievable effect on our population that occurred at that time. Assassination, it doesn't matter whether you like the president, you hate the president, assassination is a horrible thing to go through. It disrupts our government, it disrupts our country. So anyway, I decided at that point, you know, maybe I will think about protecting the president. I think that's an honorable uh, endeavor. So the next time I saw these fathers, I said, okay, I'll consider doing that. Now then, what happened after that was uh, the FBI did a huge investigation and there were many fingers pointed at many people, but the biggest thing that came out of it and the best thing that came out of it was that the FBI admitted for the first time that they were forwarding the Secret Service not just pertinent information, but they were forwarding them. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's the other way around. They were, uh, they were forwarding the Secret Service just what they screened and thought was important for the presidential protection. And so they admitted that what needed to be happening was to forward all of the information of the Secret Service. Secret Service has their own experts. They know what's important. And that was a big step in improving security. Second thing that happened, the Warren Commission wrote 18 volumes. Every agent that was on duty at that time had to read all 18 of those volumes. But the best thing that came out of that was that the Secret Service then was required to hire 200 new agents. And it wasn't a matter of do you want to. Warren Commission says you will hire 200 new agents. And I was one of those 200 new agents. Okay, now here, here's uh, something that seems to be rather small, but the, the added protection of former presidents. And, and this just came by by a stroke of a pen. President Johnson said, all former presidents will receive protection for the rest of their lives and their wives will receive protection. And what I say earlier, increase in manpower, increase in budget, increase in training. So that required that. And I got caught up in that one also because the Secret Service was in no way prepared for that. And so they put two guys on uh, the two, two, two presidents that were alive at that time were, were the permanent agents and they filled the rest of the, uh, the detail in by temporary agents. So I was supposed to have a temporary agent of a temporary assignment of two weeks, and it turned out to be six months. So I was away from my home from six months. Uh, 1968, Nassau came into being, so we dropped those uh, responsibilities. 1970, this is a huge, huge budget matter because we have 370 foreign missions in Washington, D.C. Now, if I were to tell you to go ahead and secure this building alone, can you imagine how many men it would take to do that? And so now we're talking about 370 
foreign missions. And I, I'm telling you, in many cases, they didn't even consider the fact that we needed more money in the budget. They just said, do it. That's what's happening now when you hear about some of these intrusions. Some of these guys that are on duty at the White House, the uniform division, are working 18 and 20 hours a day, no days off for four and five months, and not getting any of their overtime compensation, which they should be getting. And it's nobody's fault right now. It's just the situation. Uh, now, this also is, is, is one that is, uh, is rather uh, uh, difficult for the Secret Service because we've also picked up securing all of the major events. And you never know what they're going to be. It's just a stroke of the pen by the president. If he says, I want you to protect, uh, set up security for the, for the World Series, you, you do that. If he says, if I want you to set up security for the uh, Oscar awards or the whatever entertainment awards, Secret Service does that. And you don't even hear about that. So these are things that pop up. It's not in the budget. It's just a stroke of the pen. Uh, this just says that we have some other foreign missions in other countries that we protect. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is probably the worst thing that ever happened to the Secret Service. Because before this, we were known as a very rapid acting, very autonomous organization that could get things done quickly. And the president liked it. And all the people that dealt with the Secret Service loved it. Because they said, we need this. And the next day, they would have it. Uh, but uh, I, I would have to tell you that um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this. Um, there's just no way that anybody can budget for a situation like this. Uh, because what happened was they took the Secret Service with that reputation that I described to you. They dumped it into this big organization called Homeland Security. They took their budget and threw it into the pile. And uh, instead of being their oversight from the Secretary of Treasury, their oversight now was the Department of Homeland Security. And so in the past when they could say, I want to buy a vehicle that needs this much armor. And they would talk to the secretary, the deputy undersecretary of treasury. He'd say, yeah, go ahead and do it. Now, if they wanted to buy something like that and, and truly uh, uh, showed a need for it, it goes through all these levels of bureaucracy in the homeland security. And what took two weeks before now takes two and three months and four months. And that applies to everything that is in their function. It applies to hiring people, firing people. It applies to making changes in administration. It applies to uh, purchasing. It applies to every possible, every possible operation that you can imagine. And, um, but the biggest problem impact was 
that if I were to say to you all, uh, I want to take all the money that you've got in your pocket and put it in this pot, and depending upon what we think you need in the future, I'll redistribute it. Well, the Secret Service got less money after they put it in the pot back. They got less money back than they put in. And their mission rise creep kept, kept going higher and higher and higher. So in my opinion, uh, that's the worst thing that could have happened to the Secret Service. Now, before I, I go on with this, I want to tell you that when an agent goes into the Secret Service, there's, uh, he's on a tracking system. And the tracking system says that you will go into a field office, and in this field office, you'll be there for two to three months. Then we're going to send you to school. After we send you to school, You'll come back to the field office, work maybe four months, four years. After you work those four years, we'll probably send you to one of these permanent details. Uh, and when they're in a field office, they're working counterfeit cases, fraudery, forgery cases. They're working electronic transfer of funds, cyber cases, and all those sorts of things. But the big difference is that uh, unless they're involved in the surveillance, they're going to be home at nighttime. And so after they've worked four years there, according to this tracking system, then they go into one of the permanent protection details. Could be the president or the vice president or foreign dignitaries, all of which are very demanding. And that means that when the president goes, you go. When the vice president goes, you go. So it's not a situation where you're home at night times. So this accomplishes two things. They continue to do the investigations that are required for the US, but it also gives these guys a break and it gives them a normal life for a period of time, unless, unless they uh, are faced with a, a, a bizarre campaign like we were faced with just recently. I used to brag about being in 82 country, 82 cities with the, uh, President Reagan in one month. I can't imagine how many cities these guys were in with Donald Trump. Just cannot imagine it. So I'm, I'm saying this now from, from my opinion. I think they did a great job during this campaign. So anyway, let me go on with, with the tracking system. So the tracking system was designed to be able to give an agent an opportunity to be home for a period of time and doing something that was worthwhile and then being on the details where it's grueling, you're away from your home, you're working long hours, your time is not your own. You never can complain. You never can uh, schedule anything. And that's the way the majority of the agents uh, had their career uh, follow through. But I'm putting my career up here because for some reason, and I can't explain why, my career was vastly different than everybody else's. My career was 80% protection. Now I'm gonna stop at that point and, and say to you that there's a man named Congressman Chavez who is the, uh, who is the uh, head of the Congressional uh, Committee on Government Oversight. And when the Secret Service had some of these shortcomings, he was one of the guys that did most of the investigation. Uh, so uh, when 
when those things happened, he looked very closely into those uh, matters. And as time wore on, he began to realize what some of the problems were, and they were not the problems of the Secret Service. So he says, we should now hire a thousand new agents and uh, put those agents on. And since, now here's the kicker, since those agents are the best at protection and the best at securing buildings, then we want the Secret Service to do nothing but exclusively protection. Now, if you compare what I was just talking about, a guy who's on a tracking system with my career where I spent 80% of my time, there's no comparison. This 80% of the time is grueling. It's uh, hard on the family. You've gone away most of the time and you never know when you're gonna get a break. So uh, I'm gonna run through this just real fast to show you what, what my career looked like as compared to these guys that spent four months in the field office and then four months in protection. So th this is just to tell you uh, what happened to me. When Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968, I was on President Johnson's detail. And I was expecting to get up that morning at about five o'clock in the morning, be at the White House at seven o'clock, work my shift from seven to three, and then go home uh, and be with the family that night. So he was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan at about uh, 11 o'clock in, uh, in the morning or in, in the evening. And so I get a call about four o'clock in the morning and the agent that was working the command post says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know when you're coming back. Pack your suitcases. And, and he said, uh, then he explained to me that the president has signed an executive order authorizing protection for all uh, viable presidential and vice presidential candidates. Now you see, that's, that's the same thing that I'm talking about. Did, did the Secret Service have any idea that that was gonna happen? Absolutely none. So I did just that. And so when I got to headquarters, they said, by, uh, they said, uh, Governor Rockefeller is at uh, his Fox Hall home right outside of Washington, D.C. We want you to go up there, knock on the door, tell him that the president has signed an executive order. He now has Secret Service protection. And for the time being, you're it. And so I did just that. Knocked on the door and I said, I explained myself. I said, I'm Agent DeProspero and the uh, president signed an executive order. You have protection. And he was very gracious and he said, fine, uh, just have a seat. He said, I'm leaving for New York in an hour and you can be on my Learjet. And <laughs> when we get there, you can ride with me in my helicopter and we'll go to my uh, estate in Terrytown, New York. So I call my wife that night about seven o'clock at night and I say, I was expecting to work seven to three today and be home tonight, but I'm in Terrytown and I have no idea when I'm coming back. So that's, that's the kind of thing that happened to me uh, all the way through my career. Uh, next thing it shows is that Vice President Agnew resigns and Ford becomes president. That's, that's not a big change because at that point I was on permanent vice presidential duty and I just shifted from him to Ford. The next thing that happened was Nixon was impeached and Ford became president and Ford appointed Governor Rockefeller to be his vice president. 
And it took eight months for them to confirm uh, Governor Rockefeller. And where do you think Governor Rockefeller was from? New York City. Where do you think I spent my next eight months? New York City. And again, I, th this is not the, the fault of the Secret Service. They were trying to get me on a track, but they just couldn't make it. Okay, so this is just the national course of events. But when Governor uh, Rockefeller was sworn in as vice president, I uh, then went on his detail permanently. Again, this is not the career track that they had designed for me. Another permanent protection. Okay, we'll put this one aside for a while. Uh, so now, what they're trying to do now, and what and Chavez is trying to say is that we need to have all the agents on protection. Now, if you compare my career track with the career track of some of these other fellas who spend a lot of time in the Secret Service, but also had some time with their family, which do you think you would choose? Certainly not mine. Now, I don't, <clears throat> I don't mean to imply that I did not have a good career, because I did have a good career. And uh, it's because I look back on it as having been a part of history. Um, and if I, if I were to tell you some of the things that I did, I'm sure you would find it interesting. I, I gained the, the uh, trust and confidence of a man who is now slowly becoming known as one of the best presidents of, of the United States. I rode in like 450 official motorcades with the president in the back seat, usually some head of state or some governor. And the guy that's in that right front seat of the motorcade is the one that runs that whole movement. He's in touch with the people in intelligence. He's in touch with the counter snipers, the counter assault teams, the explosive ordnance teams, the command post. And at the same time, he's dealing with the president and whomever's in the car with the president. Could be a foreign dig, as I said, or could be Mrs. Reagan. Uh, in addition to that, I at one time, I mean, I don't know if this is a big distinction or not, it may be. I had the largest number of hours on Air Force One, even over the crew, because they had to take off because of safety. But any time the president was on the airplane, I was on the airplane with him. I'd been to more countries than I can tell you right now. I could not remember how many countries I'd been in. And one of the biggest things is I can remember being in um, a room with just three people in that room, the two presidents and myself, and they were negotiating some really, really high level stuff. And I was the only other person in that room. And of course, and of course, I met a lot, a lot of interesting people. I'm not talking about entertainers. I'm talking about very interesting people, including the Pope. And again, I'll test you guys out now. I also met a man named Hirohito. I don't know if you would call that a, an honor. I don't know what you'd call it, but it was certainly interesting. Does anybody know who Hirohito is? Yes, sir. Hirohito was the emperor of Japan when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So I met him just before he passed away. So 
I, I, I consider my part again to be part of, of, of history. And uh, I couldn't trade that for anything. And, and when you ask my family, did they suffer? Did they ha make sacrifices? They'll all tell you absolutely. But if you ask him, would you have your dad do something different than he did? They'd say, no, that's what he wanted to do. And that's what we wanted him to do. So I'm telling, uh, my purpose in telling you all of this is the Secret Service now is in a position where uh, they, they have a crossroads. I'm not sure which way they're going to go. Uh, if they go in the direction of making them nothing but protection experts and also securing public buildings and any big events, then uh, they'll have some problems. But I feel strongly that th they're working on it so diligently right now with Congressman Chavez and other people like him that they'll work that out. If they choose to try to go back to the tracking system, I think they'll work that out. Um, in either event, there are all kinds of opportunities. Now, I don't know if I'm talking to the right crowd to say this, but if you're willing right now to take a chance on which way they go, if you are willing to work long hours, 18 hours a day, for long periods of time, be away from your family, then uh, this is the time to go into the Secret Service as long as you can be properly vetted and meet all the circumstances and all the requirements. This is the time to do it because I can, I can guarantee you that the people who are really interested, who want to work, who are qualified, they're going to go up quickly in the Secret Service. And the Secret Service ranking system goes from a grade five GS-5 to a senior executive service three, which is a, a very nice situation. Uh, and if you, if you choose to do that, the, the only thing I have to say is that the, the president's responsibility, the Secret Service's responsibility is so great I don't know of any other agency that has a mission as important as the Secret Service. Nothing is more important than protecting the president. Again, I say, you, you can't imagine what kind of an impact it has on a country when you lose a president. And it doesn't matter who the president is. It disrupts everything. So if you're willing to take that chance, uh, I, I'm saying now that with that mission in mind, the Secret Service cannot afford to uh, cut corners. They can't afford to consider political, whatever political correctness is. They can't afford quotas. They can't afford to, uh, to try to reach diversity goals, none of that matters. I'm telling you that none of that matters. What matters is who is the best qualified person. They need to hire the best qualified person regardless of race, religion, sex, sexual orientation. I don't care what it is. They need to hire the best people. And then those people need to be elevated and then those people need to be placed in a position where whichever direction the Secret Service goes in now, they will be the ones to be able to lead it.